Hi, Cara. Hi, Vanessa. It's really wonderful to welcome back Dr. Jill Grimes, who I sometimes feel is like our best friend on social media. She's like always adding supportive comments and saying the kindest things. And she's smart as a whip, which is an important criteria for all of our friends. If you've listened to her previous episode, if you haven't, go and listen to it because this is not a repeat. This is a brand new episode, but she's a board certified family medicine doctor um, with a passion for preventative medicine, which as you'll hear in this episode is very relevant. And she has worked with college students um, for many, many, many years and wrote based on that experience and her medical training, the evidence-based and very funny Ultimate College Student Health Handbook, your guide for everything from hangovers to homesickness. Now that is a title. I mean, Jill is uniquely qualified because she spent 20 years in private practice and then she moved over to work at the University of Texas University Health Center. She saw firsthand what kids who had recently launched from home walked in with. It's a different perspective than when you're in private practice. And she loves to write about it. She loves to talk about it. She loves to post about it on social. Her book is actually in its third edition, which is amazing. And we love it as a graduation gift. So we talk about that through the episode, why it's a great thing to hand to a child who's walking out the door to go on to new adventures. We know you're going to enjoy Jill. We're thrilled to have her back. Here you go, Jill Grimes. And by the way, if you have a kid who's not going to college, but is moving far from home, is going to start a job somewhere, or is going to boarding school or camp or a program, an exchange program somewhere far away, the advice is still totally, totally relevant. It just, the title is very catchy. So we had to, you know, lean into that. Enjoy. Okay, now here you go, Jill Grimes. <laughs> Dr. Jill Grimes, it's very wonderful to have you here. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me back. It's funny because I feel like we hang out all the time because we're in constant conversation over Instagram. Um, so I feel a little bit spoiled. So I'm not going to make the mistake, of, which is what I do in my marriage, which is assuming that someone has been in my head and can read the first part of the conversation I was having in my own mind. Mm -hmm. So why we're friends, Vanessa. Uh, right, because we do the exact <laughs> same thing. Paul and Roger can talk about that. So I'm going to let it everyone in on the inside of our brains and frame today's conversation for you all. Um, many of you will have listened to our previous episode. I'm going to, Jill, I'm going to call you Jill now that everybody knows you're a doctor. And so again, there are two doctors on this podcast. I am not one of them, just so we're clear. But Car has conferred on me an honorary um, medical degree, which is really very nice, nice of her. Very generous. Um, You're a doctor of advice and life. <laughs> oh my God. Nice. I'm going to start that program at my made-up university. <laughs> I wonder if, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm going to do a, a made-up university and U institute VKB. that degree. UVKB. Yes. That's actually very snazzy. Um, okay, <laughs> here's the framing. Your kid is departing from your house in one way, shape, or form, whether it is to move across the country for a new job, for college, for a summer program, for some form of independence. And you want to prepare them because you worry that perhaps you will not hear from them very much. I, I will say one caveat to that framing, which is you may hear from them a lot but they may not be engaging with you on the stuff that we're about to cover. Or they may be engaging with you on their health and their decision-making in a way that is not best done by text or whatever other form. Snap, maybe you're super cool and you're Snapchatting with your kid. So Jill is here to help us think about all the information and all of the guidance that we need to give our kids before they go, which we're then going to reiterate over and over again once they are no longer living under our roof. And I'm just going to grab the new edition of her book. Hold on one second. So Jill, this is edition number three, three. Okay, of the Ultimate College Student Health Handbook. 
It's fantastic. Every single one of you listening should have it. Um, But we're going to give you some sneak peeks and some gems from the book itself and from Jill's own many years of experience. Um, So Cara, do you want to like dive into some sexy nitty gritty? I do. I want to say that for the past two years, your book has been my go-to graduation gift, which is a great gift to give kids. If you are scouting around for a gift as kids are leaving the house, they need this book. I will also add, Vanessa, to your preamble, which I think is exactly right on, that sometimes your kids will be sharing some of this information with you some of the time. They may share a snippet of it, but not give you the deep dive. Um, I've noticed in my own personal experience, it is when they want to manage the situation, meaning manage us, not manage their own situation. Um, and they're, they know we are going to worry or they know we are going to jump to tactical solution-oriented approaches. And they're not looking for that with a lot of these topics we're about to get into. So as we begin the conversation, I think reminding everyone, and this theme came up in our last podcast with Jill, um, but to reiterate it at the top here, um, it is not our job to be the tacticians for our kids as they become independent young adults. We can offer lots of suggestions. We are their emergency lifeline. We are their rock and their foundation. But if we think that we are going to be able to swoop in with the right answer every time because we know the right answer every time. And frankly, we know the right answer like most of the time, right? We've been doing this a long time as the adult caregivers in their lives. You know, that's that's the biggest mistake I make over and over and over again is I just try to solve. And that I think is the most important thing to put aside as we get into this conversation. Jill, sound right to you? Absolutely. Keep going. Some of you might be wondering if Jill's here because Cara and I are so excited about this conversation that (laughs) we can't stop talking. Okay, so let's talk about, I don't know, let's start with some of the sexiest stuff, I think. Um, You know, for me, it's the conversation that seems to come up the most often these days, um, which is one around drugs and alcohol. Um, Specifically, it's about cannabis and THC concentrations being very high. That's the active component of weed that makes people feel high. And the question that um, we often get on the parent or adult side is, you know, should I be buying for my kid from a dispensary because it's safer from a dispensary than having them go to the street, et cetera, et cetera. So I would love Jill to flip that question from there. I mean, feel free to answer that part, but let's flip it to how to engage in conversations about um, high concentration cannabis with kids who are going out into the world where this drug is, I mean, it's not legal till you're 21, but then it's legal. Right. And just because it's not legal in your state doesn't mean it isn't there. So it's an interesting question of should a parent buy from a dispensary? Um, It's a non-issue in Texas where I am because there are no legal dispensaries here. Mm. But there are certainly parents who bring it back from their Colorado trips and then dispense from there. I think I'd like to start this conversation just with the parents because there are still so many parents and you know, if they're faithful listeners of your podcast, they're they are they are going to know that this t- today's pot is you know today's weed is not pot of days gone by. But it's a really important important point because I hear so many parents. Honestly, this is a little gender bias, but especially dads saying, you know, I'm sorry, weed is just no big deal because it wasn't a big deal for them. And the first step is just making sure that both parents and kids and that have conversations around the fact that they're different they're different entities. I wish I wish it were called I wish today's weed had a different name. Yeah, totally. No, because so that so that it would just be like, oh, that's a new drug yeah. instead of oh, that's a no big deal. And the thing is from years gone by when it when the THC concentration was 3 to 5%, it truly was not 
considered addictive because there was no physical withdrawal symptoms coming from that. Now at these high concentrations, um, especially with the the dab and the oils, I mean, these things get up to above 90% THC concentration. And so it's no shock that there are withdrawal symptoms from that. But even from regular weed, uh, which is now 15 to 30% THC, there are withdrawal symptoms. But then you go, so about one in six teens that tries it gets addicted. So what does that mean in your peer group? If you're a teen, it means five out of six of your peers that try it don't get addicted. Mm -hmm. So they can use it once a week. And, you know, what is the actual damage from that? Well, we don't know yet because we don't have data for that because it hasn't been legal long enough for us to have data. Um, My guess would be that it's going to turn out to be the same thing. You know, the more you use it, the more consequences there are, just like every other thing, alcohol, other medicines, et cetera. But the problem is you don't know if you're that one in six. And it the other problem is that this is something I always talked about with STDs is if you've got a classroom or, or a friend group of 20 people, um, we can say one in six of you, let's make it 36 to make the math easy. <laughs> you've got 36 friends and one in six are going to end up in this case, becoming addicted to weed. Is it really one in six? Is it six out of your 36? No, it could be 10 and it could be one because we're talking about a big population. But teens, especially all of us, but especially teens and young adults, base their statistics in their brain of what they see happen in their friends. So if you have one friend that has a really bad trip and ends up in the hospital and ends up with a manic episode that basically never goes away. And now they're diagnosed with bipolar disorder. You're going to be scared off so, of that. So that that is my next question, which is when do kids need to take their friends to an emergency room or when do they need to seek help for themselves? You know, help us understand because I think this concept of what does a manic episode look like? What does a psychotic break look like? It's confusing to people. They don't know. It is. So a psychosis, most, most of the time with weed, you're talking about the the classic thing that is seen, particularly with these higher concentrations, is a very scary hallucination, could be auditory and or visual, usually both. And it's frequently of something really scary, like people with machine guns are chasing you and you are running to get away. And maybe it's the police or the FBI or some secret, top secret service, you know, sub- thing of the CIA that is chasing you, but it's something very intense. And this is why today's people who are high and psychotic get behind the wheel of a car and they are not, they're not meandering around and laid back. They are driving full out hundred miles an hour and a 30 mile an hour speed limit. And Jill, can you just clarify with the more concentrated weed or THC yes. products, are we seeing higher rates of psychosis as a result? Or do we not know the answer to that? I think you know, we, we need another five years of collecting data. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, for me personally in college health, I see the, the bad subset. Right. So, it, you know, and I, and I, know, I know and I acknowledge that that creates my bias because I see the bad outcomes. And I know that that bad outcome is a minority. But let me tell you, parents, when it's your kid, it doesn't matter that they're the, you know, whatever percent that is, it's 100% of their life. And, you know, I did read a headline the other day and I apologize because I don't remember what study it is, but I'll find it and I'll link it in the show notes that, you know, drinking rates are way down and nicotine use rates are way down. And what's missing from the headline and the article is this conversation that yep. where cannabis and THC rates are are heading up, up, so up. Have up, you up. have y'all heard the term uh, California sober? Yep. So no, from California, no. <laughs> That's California sober. Jill, That's you want to fascinating? Yeah. Yeah. So, so California sober means that you've given up alcohol, but you're using weed. Yeah. And that's that's a big thing. And some of it's caloric based because alcohol has more calories, a lot more calories. And, you know, so it goes back to the whole freshman 15. I'm worried about my COVID-19. But, the, um, <laughs> the, you know, the menopause, the menopause many. Uh, we need a, we need an alliteration. So, yeah. Jill, getting back to Cara's question, which I 
interrupted and then sent you in another direction. Um, And maybe we can expand it to general advice about when should kids help a friend get to this health center, to the emergency room. And I want it. So a weed induced psychosis might be one example. Um, I'd love it if you'd also talk about if they think someone's been roofied as another example. We've talked a lot about Narcan and fentanyl and having Narcan in dorm rooms. But if you could speak to the first two examples, that would be great. So. One thing is part of THC toxicity, which actually we see more with edibles, is severe nausea. So if your friend cannot stop throwing up, which would be true if it were alcohol as well, if they cannot stop throwing up after, either it's not a magic number, but I would say certainly after an hour, but probably you know even after 30 minutes, if it's just like a continuous vomiting, you need to take them to the emergency room. Okay. In terms of the psychotic portion, it's not usually subtle to be frank. It is because it's it tends to be very scary. I think the thing that might be the most subtle is uh, because I get this phone call from parents quite a bit is that their kid hasn't slept in three days, like Mm -hmm. really hasn't slept in three days. So they're manic and they are not able to sleep. And that's not quite as obvious because that tends to be the very energized person. Um, but that is a sign. Okay. Going back to your roofie, anytime that you are at a party and you know what you've had to drink and say you've had one drink or you're on your second drink and then suddenly you are like, whoa, room spinning. Things are, things are, uh, I got something else. That's when you turn to your friend, your trusted friend who hopefully is sober. And if they're not sober, then you're grabbing an Uber, but you say, take me to an ER. You need to go get tested. Um, I think this is a really important point for kids and adults alike to know, which is you can be tested for exposure to roofies and Um, I happened to be visiting my daughter at college last weekend and took a bunch of her friends out to dinner and the conversation turned to different experiences. Every single one of them around the table had with a friend. It was always a friend. And I actually, who knows if it was a friend or them, but every single person had one degree of separation from a roofie experience. And these are all kids who are well aware of it. They know all the tricks. You don't put a drink down on a table. You don't you know, pull, get a drink out of a communal vat of liquid, whatever, but every single one of them. And one in particular told a story about visiting another college campus. She was not at her college campus. She and a friend went to a party. The friend started feeling really nauseous, started spinning a little bit, didn't know what it was. They took her to the ER and the doc in the ED said, um, you know, your friend has been roofied. Um, they they didn't even suspect it based upon, because they had been taught a sort of a series of things that they, that wasn't what was at the front of their mind. They actually thought she was maybe had an infection or maybe there was something. And and there it was. And, and they felt very out of sorts, but it was a very reassuring story in that they were not even at their home college campus and they were welcomed into the health center of that oh. other college campus, right? So there are always resources. There was no judgment. They were not in trouble. She hadn't done anything wrong um, and had friends around who, by the way- And was she underage? uh, Was underage. So there was, there's that anxiety. and Emphasizing that you're not going to get in trouble. Correct. And the friends were not 100% sober, let me say, but they knew enough to not send her alone in a car. So they- Got in with so there. There's sort of a series of things you can hear all of the conversations. This is not one dump of a conversation. It's twelve conversations to have with a kid. It doesn't matter their gender. That's very Super important. important. Thing, yes. Right. Um. But yes. all of these are conversations. You will not be in trouble for showing up at a health center and getting um sort of evaluated, cared for, and diagnosed with some sort of intoxication that either you know about or you don't know about. Right. And Jill, let's just talk a little bit about what a drug dealer on a college campus looks like. Let's and do. <laughs> let's do this. Is one of my really I, I'm really passionate about this because I, again, 
I get called in in the crisis situations and almost, almost a hundred percent of the time I hear, but you know, this is my kid who would never do drugs, would never smoke. Would I, how could this, how could this possibly have happened? So let's, let's go from that perspective. You have taught your kid, your teachers, your, they've, they've taught each other. Don't do drugs. Drugs are bad. Okay. So how do you get from there to someone who ends up taking drugs? It's because a college drug dealer is a student. It is your peer. They look just like you. A college drug dealer is someone who peeks their head in your room and says, you know, when you have not slept in two nights, not because you're manic, but because you're pulling all-nighters, because which by the way, has been shown not to be the most effective thing. But anyway, you're sleep deprived, you're anxious. And they say, here, just take a Xanax. It, it, you, need a, you just need a night, one night's sleep. Here, take a Xanax. That is a college drug dealer. And it doesn't look scary or have a gummy. You can't sleep. This is, this is, well, honestly, those two things are equally common. Have a gummy, which is a THC gummy, or have a Xanax. And, you know, th those are perceived as very safe. It's coming from your friend. It's coming from your sorority sister. It's coming from your church youth group buddy. It's coming from the, your, you know, roommate. It, they're not scary people and they don't fit our perception at least not as parents, um, and usually not as students of what a drug dealer looks like. And can you say a word about why taking prescription medication that is not prescribed to you and might also be counterfeit prescription medication is so dangerous? Right. And and the reason is because it's estimated that at least 80% of street drugs are laced with fentanyl. And a good chunk of them have enough fentanyl in one pill to kill you. That's the whole one pill can kill. That's why this is so important. And the other thing is you cannot tell by looking at a pill. People who sell drugs are not dumb and they have the same pill imprint on them that our pill has that came from our CVS pharmacy. And so it looks fine. It won't mean a prescription bottle. Um, right. I haven't seen that. It's usually in a baggie, but uh, you know you can't tell by looking. So there's no there's no way to know, and that person doesn't know. And I will tell you also that it's been very interesting. I speak to a lot of um, college parent groups as well as college students, and many parents have come up to me after talk, and it's like a confessional. Mm -hmm. um, this is a common thing for doctors. Don't we feel like priests often? You know? often. <laughs> I think hairdressers, bartenders, doctors. But they'll come up and they'll say, I just have to tell you, thank you for talking about weed and saying how common it is because I found out after my kid graduated from college that they were funding their own weed use, which I didn't even know they were doing, but they were funding it by selling it. Yeah. And yeah. the same thing happens with the pills. And I, you know, there's so many layers of this as a parent. And you think about what if, one, what if your kid got the pill with fentanyl and died? Obviously, that's horrific. But almost as horrific is what if your kid gave that pill that killed someone else to, to someone. And, you know, that's why we have to have these conversations in non-judgmental ways and talk about these things. I mean, this exactly is one doing. of the broken record conversations. <laughs> and as in our episode with Jess Leahy about a, a addiction, and she's very against fear mongering in these conversations, she has said, this is one of the places where she has no problem Fear mongering because it is so terror. The fentanyl stuff is so terrifying, and we have to continue to have these conversations. I want to move beyond this corner of the conversation, but I want to wrap with a story that was so eye opening to me. I spent some time with um, some friends recently who are sending a kid off to college, um, and it's a kid who has had very open conversations with them about drug use and everything that they described was incredible. It was totally non-judgmental. It was open. It was honest. They felt empowered and emboldened in the way that they had raised this kid. Um, but they were asking me lots of questions about different concentrations of different drugs, particularly going back to the THC conversation. Um, and they were asking questions about 
what Vanessa asked about, you know, is there an association between the concentration of THC and the risk of psychosis? And I answered the exact same way you answered. Um, And they said, well, what do you think would be the safest piece of advice for us to give our kid? And they said, because it feels to us like the right thing to say is opt for lower concentration, right? Lower concentration doses of weed, whatever that looks like. Um, And we talked about how a wax pen can have up to that 90% delivery and, you know, and, and who's doing edibles versus, right? All this. And as they were asking the question, the other parent was so aware of sort of wanting to get this right and said, if this is the most impractical way through this conversation, because teaching them the, yes, I want to, you know, teach you about concentration is medically correct and scientifically correct, but they go into a dispensary and how, and by the way, one way that kids between 18 and 21 can buy, quote unquote, legally in a state where um, where marijuana is legal is with a med card. Um, right. It is incredibly easy to get med cards, sometimes from telehealth um, physicians and sometimes just fakes. And they go in and it is not sold by concentration. I mean, you can find out the concentration, but really it's sold by flavor and by delivery device and by packaging. And so if we focus the conversation too much on the the thing we know is associated with problems, the concentration, if they go to act on that advice and they walk into a dispensary, it's very hard to actually take your advice and act on it because the way these these drugs are sold, it's it's lots of different ways, none of which have to do with concentration. So there's a there's a science to it and there's a pragmatism to it. And this is where it all gets muddy and confusing as we send our kids off into the world. And this is a place where you let them guide you and you say, okay, this is all new to me. When I was in high school or college, weed was completely different. Talk me through it. The people who seem to be out of control, what are they using? What are they smoking? What are they eating? You know, the people who seem to be able to do it sometimes, like, because that's a way for them, for you to get a sense of what their reality looks and sounds like if you Mm -hmm. just ask them to educate you. So I want to continue on with the hot topics. (laughs) Sorry, no pun, no weed pun intended. Although I feel like most people don't even smoke it anymore. So hot doesn't even work as a pun. (laughs) Jill, I want to talk for a minute. So we did a great episode with Jeff Salingo about college admissions and choosing where you go to college and how do you, what calculus do you use to make choices? And one of the things that came up on social media was, hey, well, you didn't address, and honestly, Jeff was not the appropriate person with whom to address this topic, but like considerations of what women's health realities are in different states. So For those of you listening to this episode who have a kid either going off somewhere soon or or it's a kid contemplating what their future might look like and all the considerations, it's super important to do your research about what the reality is in each state and then to stay abreast of the news because the realities in that state um, could change just as you go through the college process or just from spring to fall as your kid goes off. So yes, women's health realities are a consideration. We're not going to focus on that aspect of sex in the conversation with Jill. We're actually going to talk to Jill about really about the sort of send off safe sex conversations to be having with kids, a few sort of executive functioning tricks for lack of a better phrase when our kids are not under our house and available for us to remind them to take care of certain things. Because Jill, as you have said, young people are very fertile. Very. So one thing I want to say about when you're thinking, I I do think it's important to be aware of the different women's health um, access in different states. However, there is, I have yet to meet the... 18 year old girl or boy who really thinks that they're going to be the one who either gets an STD or gets pregnant. Their brains are not wired that way. They're not wired that way. They're not wired that way. They don't, they're, they're not going to be that one, even though 
both of those things happen a whole lot. And uh, also there's, there's actually a TikTok thing going around right now about how you really should consider pulling out a form of contraception because it's not... <laughs> Yeah, that was my reaction to Vanessa, because it's only a little less effective than condoms. And that's kind of true. I mean, like it's a good 7% less effective. And, you know, why would you want to do that? That's, that's, um, so I would like to, that I mean, is not that is just that reason enough to have the US government ban TikTok right there. So a really important thing is birth control pills are very, very effective. They're not 100%, they're 99% effective when they're taken at the exact same time every single day. So one of the things that I have done for my entire practice is when I see someone is on birth control or when they're starting on birth control, I say, what time do you take it? And I want, I take it at 7 a.m. or I take it at noon. I don't want to hear, I take it at bedtime or I take it when I get up because that is going to vary multiple hours, especially on weekends and with travel. So the great thing, one one of the great things about everybody having a cell phone is that we can set alarms for all kinds of things. And I think it's really important to have your alarm set for your birth control pill. So that is something that you can teach your daughters who are taking birth control pills. Um, make sure they take it at the same time every day. And honestly, even if they're taking it for acne or for painful periods, it it you know it's still a better idea. You're going to have less breakthrough bleeding, less other problems with it if you take it at that same time every day. So that's really important. And then the second part is that that's great, but that doesn't protect you against sexually transmittable infections, obviously. So for that reason alone, also add on a barrier which is typically a condom. I'm laughing because the alarms that they set are different than the alarms they set for other things like wake up alarms. So you might hear yes. funny sounds come out of their phone and that's often, <laughs> yeah. And you're yes. like, oh good, they're taking their birth control. Oh, there's a um, barking dog, yeah. Bill, <laughs> are you noticing, just anecdotally, we're, we're hearing about more and more young people getting IUDs and not necessarily using the pill. Are you seeing that with the young people that you work with. Yes. That is, that, I mean, that's been a trend for the past decade. Right. So there was for a long time, there was uh, people thought you couldn't have an IUD if you were a virgin. And so there was uh, like doctors thought that, and uh, that's not true. And so that it's, that's been a thing. So, but the same case needs to be made. If you have a kid who's getting an IUD, that does not protect them against SCIs and you need to have that right. conversation as well. Car, you look like you want to say something. Well, I was hoping we could take this conversation and transition it to um, a slightly broader conversation, which is when kids see a healthcare provider um, and you are not there, and this can happen when they're living under your own roof, frankly, um, oh. they might go in, they might drive themselves into their pediatrician to see their pediatrician. Um, most pediatricians um, are pretty good about making sure that if the kids are under 18, they're in contact with the parents, but uh, it's not always possible and the care is important first. So let's just talk a little bit about how we can teach our kids to best communicate openly with healthcare providers and follow up with healthcare yes. providers. And yes, just a quick note, your kid needs their insurance card. Yes. And they need it saved in their scanning on their phone. They need it saved in their photos. They need their insurance card 85 different ways and they need to memorize their social security number as well. Okay. So that's and just and, I, and your and the, and they need to have they don't have to well, I mean it'd be nice if they could memorize it, but they also need the social security number of the guarantor of their health insurance, which is and, one and of the you. date of birth, which may be yes. the most challenging, is actually remembering yes, I don't their know parents. That. They don't know the date year. <laughs> and so, and, and it, it's so funny because Vanessa and I just launched this curriculum, this health and sex ed curriculum, and there are state standards in many states requiring a personal health class as part of health and sex education. And the content in that class is this: like, yes, what do excellent. you want to know yeah. Yeah. when? Right, because. You, there's a lot you need to know. Okay, go on. So also one easy way is to do a Google Doc, which all of our kids use, even if some of us are slow adapting that, but you can have a Google Doc that has your insurance information and your family health history, their immunizations, most importantly, their tetanus shot. Please make sure that they have that. And 
And, but and probably it, not their social. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of identity theft. Right, 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 there. right. So just if, I mean, they memorize very little in today's world because this handheld computer True. in their hand, in the palm of their hand. So just right. memorizing those social security numbers is key. Yes. Great idea. So here's what I would love everyone. And, and parents, guess what? This is great. This is great for you too mm-hmm. when you see your doctor. There's two things. The first is especially for kids and talking about all these awkward topics and realizing that it is quite possible when they go to a college health center that it might be a concern for something a bit awkward for them. And the first thing is doctors have seen it all. College campus doctors have seen it all twice. (laughs) And don't be embarrassed. Lead with what you're there for. Because a lot of times people will come in and they'll say they're there for one thing. And then right before the doctor walks out, um, I'm going to use the example of a missing tampon. The doctor's about to walk out of the room and they're like, also, you know, I had my period last week and I, I'm not sure if I got the last tampon out or not. I couldn't, I couldn't find the strain. And the thing is that can be taken care of and it's easy to take care of and it should be taken care of. But, but now, now the doctor's on the way out and it just, it makes the whole thing much more difficult. So don't wait till the last minute to ask your question. But the other thing is, and this is true, whether you're there for an upper respiratory infection or depression or a sprained ankle, we have to teach our kids to say, after the doctor says, okay, here's the plan, they must ask, what's next? Mm -hmm. What's the next step? Because what I hear all the time is, well, I went to, I went and got an antibiotic, but then my, my cough just kept getting worse. I'm like, well, what did, did you go back? Well, no, they didn't go back. Cause they, cause you know, they'd already been to the doctor. They were like, well, you know, they would have fixed did it. Did you finish the antibiotic? No, I was starting to feel better. So I didn't finish it. Right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. So we need them to ask very specifically, not only what symptoms should I look out for? Like, or if it, if I'm not getting better after how many days, mm-hmm. when should I follow back up? And how do I follow back up? Do I send you a message through mm-hmm. the patient portal, which is going to be the most common way? Or a lot of universities have a 24-hour nurse help mm-hmm. call in. You know, they'll say call in and say what your symptoms are. But have that next step because mm-hmm. the doctor has it in their head. They know, okay. And let's let's take antibiotics and, and illness out of it. Let's say that someone's there for stomach pain. And it's, you know, it's probably a gastritis and, you know, we give them some acid blockers or whatever, but, you know, maybe it's pancreatitis, Mm -hmm. but we're not going to jump to that right away. And so we're going to, we have this level of care and the doctor will say, yeah, if you don't get better, let me know. But in their head, the doctor's also thinking, and then the next step would be that we're going to do some lab work. And then if that's abnormal, then we would do this. You know, we have it, but you're not necessarily going to say that, especially in a rushed, you know, healthcare setting, which is just the truth. Or if, you know, there's multiple questions. So you want to know what's the next step if this doesn't work and how how soon should that happen? And yes. how do I contact you back? That's right. Because right. you know, the text thread with the parent is like, oh, here's what they told me. And the parent is going to ask five questions and they're going <laughs> to say to you, I didn't ask that. Or like, oh, yeah. I didn't think about that. I mean, one thing I've been trained as a parent to ask is, what should I be concerned if I see, right? Because then I know if I don't see those things, then it's just, it's whatever it is working its way out. But what should I be concerned about if I, if I see? And Jill, this is one of these situations where everyone's going to roll their eyes. I'm going to say it like practice it with your kid. I mean, sit down with your kid and say, I'm the doctor. You're the patient. I do this all the time. (laughs) You comment, right, except you're actually a doctor. (laughs) Um, But you say like, you know, let's think about the most embarrassing thing you could tell a doctor that you have. Like, come in, tell me, what are your follow-up questions? What Like, they have to build this muscle and they're not going to build the muscle when they're sitting in the office, they're stressed out, they're scared, they're embarrassed, they're ashamed, whatever it is. That's not when you build that muscle. You are going to fall flat. You build the muscle when you are, Come when you're with someone you know, when you're trusted. So practice it out in whatever way your kid will be willing to do so. And for people with younger kids, um, let them start telling their own history mm-hmm. when you're in a doctor's office. Because 
It will take 10 times as long. It will be very circuitous and half inaccurate. Fine. They got to practice telling their story that, you know, that 90%, 80 to 90% of a diagnosis is based on the history. It, you know, very little is based upon when we look in the ears or in the throat or listen with the stethoscope or do laps. And so telling your story is key. Uh, Jill, in our last few minutes, we thought it would be fun to do a rapid fire round where right. we gave you, actually this list came from you. So you gave us and we're giving back to you because this is your top 10 list of problems that you see on college campuses and um, you have very quick tips. All right. So you do it. Speed round. So we're going to start. I don't know if this is number one or not. Is Are they numbered in order of, of how oh, often I you just- see them? Okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to start them with the topic that we already covered a little bit, but quick tip on a missing tampon or vibrator. So in a vagina or in an anus, go. Yes. For missing tampon, you can attempt once or twice to remove yourself. Make sure you wash your hands first. But honestly, anything that has disappeared into the anus is not coming back out easily and you need to go in right away. Okay. So and no shame. I see no it all the time. Exactly. It just Tell- needs to be removed. It's not, it is what it is. You're not going to be the first. You won't be the last, but don't wait. In the same geographic region, constipation. Let's talk about constipation. Quick tips. Quick tips. You need three things to not be constipated. You got to have, you got to be hydrated. You got to have fiber and you got to have movement. And you have to not have a fear of bathrooms. So you need privacy. So a lot of times when kids get off to college, they're very anxious about the noises they make when they poop and they are in shared spaces. And so the easiest thing straight off is to find a few private bathrooms. There's always some in your where your classes are and make sure you have that as well. But water, fiber, and movement, those are the three keys. And they're probably not getting enough fiber or enough water. So exactly. go back to basics with nutrition and hydration and exercise with right. particularly with a college. Back on high fiber cereals, fruits and vegetables, water, all the things. I, I would add to that list that um, kids are also a little bit ashamed of smell that they produce. Yes. And poopery, uh, poopery, poopery, poopery is the yes. favorite college product of all time. Okay. Um, let's do ear piercing infections, a common one at all ages, but now you don't live at home and you have a pierce right. somewhere and it's infected. Go. Okay. So really, this is the most important take home. If the piercing, we're talking about ear piercings. If the piercing is in your lobe, honestly, 99% of the time, you can take care of that yourself. All you do is you keep cleaning with sterile saline and that will resolve on its own. That's not a big deal. But anything on the cartilage is a big deal. Do not treat by yourself. So all these spring break piercings that just happened that are now infected, 30% of cartilage uh, piercings will get infected. They often require oral antibiotics. Don't wait. Poor blood supply. You need to see a doctor. And um, I would would just add to that that in the lobe, um, often you got to take the earring out as part of the treatment. It doesn't always come out very easily. Sometimes there's a big scab. Sometimes the skin has grown over it. Sometimes there's a lot of pain. So you don't have to be shy about getting that one checked either if you're not sure Sure. what to do. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Well, food poisoning. Food poisoning. And how do you know the difference between food poisoning and too much alcohol? That's a good question. Usually you don't know the difference. Um, and the food, po- the, the biggest thing here, food poisoning rarely requires antibiotics. I would push it to say almost never. A lot of times people get freaked out when they think they have food poisoning or maybe they have food poisoning you know, because multiple people all ate the same leftover sandwich uh, and, and all got throw up in diarrhea. But if you are having symptoms persisting beyond three days, you need to go in. But generally that is something that hydration and time take care of. And you said don't throw up in the sink. Oh, yes. Don't puke in the sink. This is really important. Thank you for (laughs) saying that. When kids go off to college, they must be taught don't puke in the sink because usually there's a sink in every dorm room. Now, nowadays dorms are some, depends where you go to school, but they're getting very elaborate and a lot of people do have private bathrooms. But but even then you might throw up in a sink because you pass a sink before you get to a toilet. don't do that. It clogs the plumbing. If you throw up in the sink, 
one of the things to keep in your first aid kit is um, dog poop bags, you know, and same way you just <laughs> put your hand in the bag, invert it, pull out the puke so that you get the big chunks out and then wipe with a paper towel. Otherwise you're going to have a clogged sink on top of everything else. Oh, Sorry, gross, gross but the vegetables here are amazing. Let's, <laughs> let's stay in that same general neighborhood with heartburn. Okay, heartburn. Fine. We're preparing for finals now. We are in heartburn season. All that caffeine and nicotine, unfortunately, a whole separate one. Um, I know you guys talked with Dolly Clock about that. So anyway, these things cause heartburn. The fastest relief for heartburn is chewable and acids that will work faster than pills that are anti-acid pills. And nosebleeds, Jill? Yes, nosebleeds. One of the things to keep in your first aid kit is some Afrin. Um, the generic's perfectly fine, but that is not something you use regularly. That's a nose spray that just constricts blood vessels. But when you get a really bad nosebleed, which we see a lot, especially with the changing temperatures and in the South, when it's hot, we have the air conditioning, everything gets so uh, dehydrated. But if you have a bad nosebleed, you can save yourself a trip to the emergency room or urgent care often by after holding pressure without checking every minute, you have to hold pressure and um, you hold it for a solid 10 minutes. And then you do a quick squirt of Afrin. A lot of times that will take care of it and save you a trip. Because that's the first thing we do. I hear all the time, I feel like I'm having heart palpitations. <laughs> yes. So heart palpitations, also most likely caffeine or caffeine plus decongestants or caffeine plus decongestants plus ADHD stimulant medications. Mm -hmm. Very common. If you're having them, you can definitely, you know, please get them checked out. Most of the time, it's what we're putting in that is creating them. Also, excessive alcohol can do that. Pretty much everything that college students do can cause palpitations, <laughs> including anxiety. But when you put them all together, like at midterms or finals, that's when we start seeing them. And if they're troublesome, we definitely need to see. You. How about a picture of a cut? Do I need stitches? Yes, no. What do I put on this cut? Yes. So that may or may not have been a text thread that happened in my phone there, recently. Just recently. Okay. And if you could show pictures, it would be helpful. But um, the bottom line is if a cut is more than a quarter of a quarter of an inch deep, more than three quarters of an inch long, or if there's a gap in it. So you can't, you know, you know, when you get a cut, sometimes it's just a straight line that is unlikely to need stitches. But when there starts being a gap, it doesn't close. You have to kind of push the sides. You're going to need some kind of thing. So that you need to go in for. Please don't use super glue. Architect majors, I am talking to you. Please don't use super glue. They all, because they, they especially this time of year, they use their box cutters right. to make their amazing, amazing projects. And they'll tell you, I mean, they tell me all the time, they, they, they keep super glue there. Please don't do that. Um, come in, let us do it. And the reason Jill is saying that is because lingering little infections underneath yes. it turn into nasty infections. Two more quickies and then we're out. Uh, pink eye. So pink eye, the quickie here is that most of the time it does not require antibiotics. And um, it's more a matter of, it is very contagious. You have to have good hand washing, but you want cool compresses for pink eye. For a sty, however, in your eye, you need heat. So sty is a little pimple and you can, the best way to do it, moist heat that really holds it is a rice sock. You take uncooked rice, put it in a sock, tie a knot in the sock, put it in the microwave for 30 to 60 seconds, pull it out, test it on your hands so you don't burn your face, but it should be moist and hot. And then you just hold that on your eye. You could use an oom sock because then it won't smell. Uh, the could, last- <laughs> College students don't have new socks. <laughs> exactly. They should. Uh, the last one, one is strep go. Strep. The biggest take home, if you only remember one thing about strep, you know what symptoms of strep throat are. It's going to be a sore throat, right? Probably with a fever and also swollen nodes. But the big thing is no cough. If you have a big cough along with your sore throat and stuff, it is very unlikely to be strep. Not never, but much less likely. Um, along with that, and then we're going to let you go, Jill, when to get tested for mono. If you, especially if you have strep throat, you can get mono without strep throat but a lot of times they travel together. Basically, if you have red pussy tonsils and you go in and they do 
a strep test and it's negative, if you are not feeling better, you're considering continuing to have fever or fatigue after three, four days, you go right back in and get tested again. You can also have mono without big impressive tonsils if you're having a lot of fatigue and such, but still common, much less talked about. We've been talking about COVID so much, we quit talking about things like strep and mono, but they are definitely out there. This is why everyone needs your book, Jill, because Mm -hmm. we run out of time every time. You are a real wealth of information and a pragmatist and a reminder in every single way that if you can't manage it on your own or you're not sure you can manage it on your own, there are people like Dr. Jill Grimes at College Health Centers waiting for you, wanting to help you. And there are people like that across the country outside of college campuses too, for young adults everywhere. So the the greatest take home message of this podcast is communicate show up at a doctor or a healthcare provider's office communicate what's going on and know that the person who's sitting there chances are is a lot like Jill full of great information wanting to be helpful so use it and not Absolutely. judging not judging and if you have to have these conversations with your kid, which you do, even if you're dreading it, you can adopt Jill's tone, which is matter of fact, no judgment. You are not the only one. Even if inside your head, you're screaming that you cannot believe you have to have this conversation with your kid, it's better. They have the information and are safer than they don't have it at all. And if really in doubt, get Jill's book and hand it to your kid and say, read chapter one and come back to me with any questions (laughs) (laughs) or stick a $20 bill in each chapter that you think is important. I've had every page, every page. (laughs) Jill, you're uh, the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if I could, my last thing to say is the biggest thing too, to communicate is don't wait until you're in crisis to seek help. Whether that is the sprained ankle or an STD or depression, do not wait till you're in crisis or test anxiety. Please go in. This is what we do in College Health and we are here to help. Love that. Thank Thank you, Jill. Jill. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. You can email us with questions, feedback, or episode requests at podcast at lessawkward.com. If you want to learn more about what we do to make this whole stage of life less awkward for everyone involved, our parent membership, our school health ed curriculum, our keynote talks, and more are all at lessawkward.com. And if you want products that make puberty so much more comfortable, visit myoomla.com.